Okay, so here's some announcements. Um, we do have a written homework due Wednesday, and that all that material is covered on the exam for Thursday. So uh, you got your exam Thursday. Um, here's all the resources you have for studying. You have the four homework assignments, and all the stuff that I've assigned in the workbook in terms of worksheets. Um, all the class videos are posted in the, there's a area on Blackboard called class videos. Go back and watch those. Um, especially ones from like the first couple of weeks of class. Because you may watch those and, and have totally forgotten that we covered that stuff. So proportionality, um, constant rate of change, linear function, that's all crucial stuff. Okay, so you can review all the classes. And then um, I posted an exam prep area on Blackboard. The first thing there is the review outline. This is really the only, of all these resources, it's really the only thing that's a comprehensive list of everything that's on the exam. So everything else is pertains to that, but none of these other items really cover everything. So there's that review outline. Sample items pertain to the content on the exam, but um, it's just really kind of just to give you some idea of what the exam is like. So that's similar to what the exam is like. Um, you've got all these web work problems. You can work on those at webwork.asu.edu for some uh, bonus on your exam. Um, though, to submit for the extra credit, you have to submit by Wednesday at midnight. Okay? So you can't, after midnight, all the answers will be revealed, so you can keep working on it. But you just can't you can't submit anymore for extra credit. But it's all you can keep working on it, and you can keep and you can see the answers after midnight Wednesday. And then uh, later today, I'm gonna get things in order for our top hat class in terms of setting everything visible for you to review all the questions that I've given you in class for the whole semester. Okay, any questions about this week, the exam? So, so the exam is Thursday. It's the same procedure as the pretest, except that you can have a calculator this time. So you're going to need to bring your sun card and have a calculator. And then uh, you can enter into the testing center anytime after 10.30 in the morning and before 6.30 in the evening. And then they open until 8, so you can they'll, they'll collect the last tests at 8, 8.15. 8.15. So it's uh, unlimited time except for when the 8.15 hour comes. All right, um, I would expect the average is going to be around an hour. The average amount of time it will take you to complete the test will be around an hour. So depending on if you're a quick or a slow test taker, you can plan accordingly. Okay? Any questions about our exam this Thursday, February 7th? Is that right? February 7th. <clears throat> the testing center is a place that like in the catacombs down there. Same place you took the pretest. Same place, the same procedure in place you took the pretest. Make sure you have your sun card. Okay. <clears throat> so we are talking about uh, composition of functions. Oh, and just again, it's your friendly reminder. Tutor room, check that out if you haven't yet. Please make use of it. ECA 216, it's right across the street from the entrance to the bookstore. Don't be scared to go there, all right? There's just tables. You can just go and work on your homework. You're not obligated to bring questions. Just go and go with a study partner, study, work on homework, and then uh, if you have questions, it's the best help you're going to get on campus, which doesn't mean it's perfect, okay? But there's, we're trying to train those tutors as best we can in this curriculum, okay? Um, some are better than others. So if you have a bad experience, try a different time and a different person. Okay. So we want to start on page, I think it's 101 in your book. On page 101, take about five minutes to work on number one. So page 101, number 1, A through E.
So this is continuing where we left off on composition of functions. Composition of functions. And what was that again? That's it's like putting two functions in succession, where you where the process of the first function is executed, an output comes out, and what happens? You take that output, goes the input into the second function, and then you get a final output. So it's a two-step function process where the output of the first becomes the input of the second. So this is again about that stuff. <coughs> Okay, you don't have to whisper. You can work together. So you, you're welcome to think on your own or work together. You don't have to whisper. Sometimes making a table of values of corresponding ordered pairs helps to figure out what the rule is, okay? Or the formula. So make, make a set of ordered pairs that helps to figure out what that formula or that rule for the function is. Make a lap for questions. Catch me if you have a question. But to figure out the formula of the rule, it helps to make ordered pairs.
Okay, let's let's uh, regroup here, see how your progress was. So for part A, let's really break down this function. What's the name of the function? F, right? F is the name. <clears throat> what quantity is the input into F? If it says we want number of hours in terms of area, which one is the input? If we want number of hours in terms of area, which is input? I heard X area. The rest of you agree? So when we have a function, do our functions output in terms of input, or are they input in terms of output? When you have a rule for a function, output in terms of input. So which will be the input? The area. He was right, right? So X is the area. What's the output of this function? Then? That's our time. Okay. So the question is, what's the rule? So we're going to have f of x or t? x is going to be our time. So the question is, what formula, will the formula have x's in it or t's in it? x's, right? So it's going to be a formula of x's that will give us t. That's what we wanted. We want time in terms of area, or output in terms of input. So to get this, it's kind of it's helpful to maybe come up with a table here. We know that 350 square feet means four hours. Then what would 700 square feet be? It'd be eight. And how would you find the number of square feet that would correspond to one hour? What would you do? Yeah, yeah. If three if it's 350 square feet for four hours, then one hour would be one fourth of that. And what is that? 87.5? So now the question is, what's the rule that takes us from x to t? What do we do to x to get t? That's what we're going to, so what do we do with x's that's going to give us the corresponding t? What's that? He wants to divide by 87.5. Is that what it is? Yeah. So this divided by 87.5 is 4. Each one of these divided by 87.5 is 4. So we could write it that way. Or you could multiply by 4 over 350. It's the same thing. So multiply by 4 over 350 or divide by 87.5. Same thing. So uh, let's just go with the first one. So x divided by 87.5. Does it make sense? Are we good on function f? Any questions? OK, next function. What's the name? g output is, or say input, t hours. Output, to find a function g to express the laborer's cost c in terms, of tower, in terms of t hours. The output will be c. Okay? So the rule will be, so we want output c is a function of t. So we're looking for a formula that has t's in it or c's in it. The formula. T's, right? They'll have it's always in terms of the input. The rule is in terms of the input, so it'll be a formula with T's that will give us C. What will the rule be? This one's a little easier. Every hour costs thirteen twenty-five. So in T hours, how would you find the total cost? That's right. Questions on making those functions? That's, that's review. OK. So now we want a function that <coughs> h that relates labor cost and total square feet of area. So let's take a look at what would make sense. 
f of g of t or g of f of x. Do they both make sense? Just one of them or neither? So let's look at the first one. What's the output of g? Cost, right? So this would be like taking the f function and giving it a cost. What does f think about that? Doesn't like it. f has a function. Its function is to take what? Area. area. It takes area and it spits out? Time. So now we're, we're coming along to the function machine and we're saying, here function, take this cost. It says, I don't know what to do with that cost. My function is to take area and give you time. I can't, I can't do this. I don't know what to do with this. Doesn't make sense. So let's try this one. What is the output of the f function? <coughs> is that something the g function likes? That's what g, the g function, what, it, what does it do? It takes time and gives you a cost. So this is valid. So the output of f is time, so it's valid to give it to g because g takes time and gives you cost. OK, so let's see about, now so what we want to do is get a one step rule here. Now let's draw the picture here. <coughs> so if it's g of f of x, what comes first? g or f? What comes first in the process? They're saying f. Agree with that? So we got our machines here. Everyone agree that f comes first? Yes. And the input of f is? x. And out of f comes? t. And that goes into g. And out comes? c. So, rather than doing it as two steps, what would the input and output be of a single function that would have the same, the same function as the two-step process? What would the input and the output of a function be that has the same overall function as the two-step process? Tell the person next to you, what would the input and output be of the one machine that does this, what this, these two do, in, in order, okay? Go. Tell the person next to you. What would the input be and the output? So I should hear a lively conversation. So H. If H does the same thing as these two do all together, what would go into H? What would come out of H? What would go into H? Area. 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 And what would come out? Cost. You would never see time. We would never see time. We would put in area. How much, how much area is in this room? And we want to know how much it's going to cost us. And the time would be gone, right? The middleman would be gone. So how do we do that? We know we want G of F of T, or F of X, because F of X comes front first. So here's how we come up with that, that single step function. What is f of x? We found it was x over 87.5. So all I'm doing is replacing the f of x in there with the rule, which is f of x. Now we're going to follow g's instructions <laughs> on the new input into g. So what, what does g tell us to do with the input? Yeah, it says take the input and multiply it by 13.25. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to take the input and we're going to multiply it by 13.25. 13.25 times the input. And I think, if I remember correctly, it's like 0.15. One four about x.
So now this is a single formula whose input is area, and if you plug the area into this, it's just going to directly give you the cost for that much area. And so that's a new function that they're telling us to call h, h of x. Okay. Any questions on this situation? Yes, sir. No, so that's that's okay too. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they're both the same. They're both the same thing. They're both. You plug in x. It's giving you cost. Yeah. Other questions. So and then we saw that doing g first doesn't work because the output of g is cost, and then we'll be trying to put cost into the f function, which doesn't make sense. Can I erase this screen? Are we good? Okay, so that's what we said. So now, if there's no context, So if there's no context to the uh, to the functions, so here's three functions, f, g, and h. Okay. Here there's no there's no real world meaning to what x is and what the output of f is, and what the output of g is and what the output of h is. So it's perfectly legitimate in this type of situation to say, all right, let's let's perform the g function first and then put its output into f, or or the reverse, because there's no there's no uh, quantity associated with them, and so it's perfectly legitimate. So let's practice this. So what I want you to do is, maybe um, on page 100, you've got a blank sheet there. You could work on these on that blank sheet. Let's do f of g and g of f, OK? Once you get the once you get it set up, don't you don't have to do any simplifying past the first step, okay? But we want to get a formula. We want to get a formula that would be like the one step formula for this two step process, right? But what's the one step formula that would have the same result as going through this two step process? So see if you can do it. I'll just give you a hint to get started. You're going to start by saying f of, and here you're going to start by saying g of, and then you're ready to go. Okay, so I'll take a lap for questions. Not me, got a question.
So I saw some of you correctly had that. That's what g of x is. And so now we're going to uh, apply the rule of f to this input. So I'm going to do it in red, actually. And so what does the rule of f say? It says take two times what? The input squared plus three times the input minus one. What's the input? x over x minus four. So this is the single rule that would have the same effect as that two-step process of doing g first, taking the output of g, putting it through f. Does it make sense? Anybody have a question? So what about the next one? What's the, what is the rule for f of x? And what's the rule for g? What does g say to do? It says, take the input and divide by the input minus 4. Right? Isn't that what that, the g function says? And so what's our input? Do you get the same result? Do you get the same process when you switch the order of the two functions? Not even close, right? Totally different. So what you would get if you did g first and then f is a totally different outcome than if you did f first and then g, which is shown by comparing those two one-step versions of them. Totally different. Okay, any questions on, that's where we're going to stop with composition of functions. Any questions on that? Okay, so what we do next, what we're starting now, is going to definitely keep using this, so we'll get more practice. Can I erase the, what's up there? So now what I want you to do is take five minutes to work on, get our minds oriented here, page one o. 109, number one. It should feel like review, okay? So there's a, a little bit of new stuff, but it should feel like all the stuff we've already done. So page 109, number one, A through E.
Okay, get a partner. Share your thinking so far on what you've done with each other. Okay, share your thinking so far what you've done. Okay, in this part B, it says solve GX equals 212. So 212, output or input of G? 212, is that the output or the input of G? That's the output, and so we're asking what input would give us 212, and if you did the math, so you, you set up 9 fifths X plus 32 equals 212, you should have gotten 100. Did you get 100? Okay, now is that Input of G, is that degree Celsius or Fahrenheit? Celsius, because G, the input is Celsius, and the output is Fahrenheit. Okay, so now we want an H that converts Fahrenheit to Celsius. So there, what's the input then? Is the input Fahrenheit or Celsius if it's going to convert Fahrenheit to Celsius? Fahrenheit, okay. And so the output will be? Celsius. So the rule, will it be F's or C's in the rule? Uh, right, so the rule always operates on the input to give you the output. So we want, basically what we want is C equals something with F's in it. And how will we get that? We can use this. How will we get C equals a formula with F's in it from that? <coughs> What's that? Yeah, I'm going to solve for C. So first step in solving for C, subtract 32. So we'll have our F minus 32. So I just subtracted 32. And now I'm going to isolate C. So last step to do is? Yeah, so you could divide by 9 fifths or multiply by 5 ninths. So this is the rule of... <coughs> F that would give us C, and that's exactly what the H function is. We need a rule with F's in it that gives us C. So it's 5 ninths, F minus 32. Okay. Are we good on B and C? Any questions on A, B, or C? Okay, so now we've got our original function was called G. Input was? Celsius, output, Fahrenheit. And then we have the H function, right? So this right here is telling us to do what first? What comes, what do we do first according to that notation? Are we going to use the G function first or the H function? G, and what's going to go into G? It's telling us to put 100 into G, and what's going to come out? 
We know that, right? It's 212. That's what we found right here. That if 100 goes into G, 212 comes out. So now it says take that 212 and do what? Put it into H, right? And what's H going to do? It's going sw to gonna switch it back, right? Because how are G and H related? Well, what's that mean? Inverse. <coughs> Opposite, not quite. One function undoes the other one. Yeah, so it undoes it, or it reverses it, or it's like, so, it, so like the output and input are inverted, right? So whatever this does, its inverse function will undo it. Or whatever direction this process goes, this process goes the reverse direction. So you just make a circle, right? So you, you put in the, the Fahrenheit, or put in the Celsius into G, it gives you the Fahrenheit, take that Fahrenheit, put it into H, it's going to give you back the Celsius that you started with. Okay? <clears throat> so let's prove that. Let's prove that that's true. So looking at, so which one of those is what we did? Is, do we just do G of H or H of G? Is this G of H or H of G? H of G. In H of G, G comes first. That's what we did. So let's look at H of G of K. And like we did before with the, with the painter problem, let's follow it. Let's chase out the math here. Let's chase out the algebra. So this says do H of what? What are we putting into H if it's G of K? That's right. G of K would be 9 fifths K plus 32. Okay, that's what G is. G of K, sorry, G of K. So now, what does H say to do? Here's our H function. It says take 5 ninths of the input minus 32. And what's our input? All right, are you tracking with me here? I know one person is. So, does it make sense what I'm doing here? G of k is the rule for, for g with k as the input. Now I'm going to follow the rule for h with that as the input. And the rule for h is 5 ninths times the input minus 32. So my input is what I did in blue. So we can simplify that. What is 5 ninths? Or no, so we got to do in parentheses first. So we got 5 ninths of, we got 9 fifths K plus 32 minus 32. What's left? 9 fifths K is left. And what's 5 ninths times 9 fifths? That's all going to equal 1, so we're left with? Does it make sense that that should be K? Any temperature in Celsius that we put in the G function and find its Fahrenheit and then put through the reverse process, we're going to get what we started with, right? It's going to go full circle, okay? So we're putting it through the process to get Fahrenheit, then taking that Fahrenheit and re going through the reverse process of H. And it's, it should give us back what we started with. Okay, so you should practice on your own time. We don't have time now. Practice this. And what ex when you do all the algebra for that, you're expecting to get what? N, right? You're expecting to get N. Why? Because you're going to take a Fahrenheit temperature. It's going to give you Celsius, H. Put that Celsius into the, the G function. It'll reverse it, give you back the original Fahrenheit. Can I erase this screen? So this is the idea of inverse functions. A, a, a 
function is the inverse of another if it undoes the process of the original one or reverses the process of the original. So how does it relate to input and output? So what about the input and output of H relative to G? In terms of the quantities. So the input of G is like? It's like the output of H. And the output of G is like the input of H. They, the output and the input switch. Can I erase this screen? So here, so the notation that we use, if we start with a function f, the reverse process is notated f to the negative one, but we call we say f inverse. Here's the key: it does not mean one over. It means what we said it means. It means take the process and go backwards. So if a equals f of x, <clears throat> and say the output of the inverse is b, so this b, how does it relate to the original function f? The out, so that's the output of f inverse. How does it relate to the original function f? It would be the input. It would be like the input. And the output of our original function would be like the input of f inverse. So these two match up. The output of the inverse is the input of the original. And the output of the original is like the input of the inverse. So let's practice this. Here's our same tables from Friday when you had the top hat questions, but now we're going to deal with inverses. So let's just practice here. Let's do Q, say Q of <coughs> negative, or Q of negative 2. What does Q of negative 2 equal according to the Q function? Someone said 3. Agree with that? So here, this was this came up after class. Q of x does that mean input or output of q? Q of x is that the input or the output of q? Those are outputs. These, so these are outputs of q for the given input x. So these are outputs. All right. So what is q of negative two? Three. So how can we write this statement in terms of its inverse, the inverse function of q? Q of what would be what? Q of 3 would be negative 2. That would be the reverse process. If you had the output of Q, the inverse function would return the corresponding input. OK, so I want you to work on these. This is, this is not top hat. This is just on paper. So you're going to decide. Um, wherever, yeah, you can do it in your book or in your own notes or wherever you're going to be able to find later. You don't have to, don't have to copy the tables now. Okay, the only way you're going to know is if you talk. So talk and see how you're doing. Okay, talk with each other and see if you see if you agree.
Okay, do you see why P inverse of 2 is 1? Related to P, the P function, this is the input of P that would give an output of 2. You see that? So it's the, this is the output of P inverse when the input is 2, but according to P, it's the reverse. It's the, it's the opposite. It's, that's the input of P that would give an output of 2. So that's 1. What about Q inverse of 4? Also 1. Okay, written homework due Wednesday. I couldn't, uh... <coughs> the thing is, yeah, they switch. Q inverse of what equals 0? Which is the same thing as saying Q of 0 equals what? Does that make sense? Oh, okay. yeah. You see? So Q of 0 equals what? No, not 3. Negative 1. Q of 0, oh, okay. if you plug 0 into the Q function, you get negative 1. So just negative 1? Well, no, that's, not, that's this, right? So negative 1 is this. So now, this thing right here is negative 1. So P of x is negative 1. Now we're asking what input into just the plain old P function gives negative 1? Negative 2. Make sense? So here you just go, this, I'm doing A, because it's really, so you go here, here, nope. and then, no, that's not right. and then go, go back no. here to get 1. No. P of minus 2 P inverse So say we're trying to find out what this equals, right? So what we're saying is then if P inverse of 2 is what we don't know, then that means the input and output switch for the P function. See, this is like the input that would give this output of P because they switch. Reverse process, output and input switch. So we're asking what input of P Gives two. One gives two. Now, but the, what you explained didn't really. I was, the wrong, I was on the wrong level. No, but it's not. You were do. You were going all over the place. There's only one one line to look at in this to answer this. Right? It's not two steps. It's just a one step deal. Okay. So Q inverse of four. So the end point is 4, so you need to figure so out what gives here's, you. So this is the input into Q inverse? So the input becomes the output, so Q of... So Q of, of, what, equals of what equals, right. Oh, okay. See? 1. 1. That's right. Okay. I'm just trying to come up with, like, ways to remember this and basically like undo. The way you remember it is that Given a function that has input and output, its reverse process, the, the input of the original function is like the output of the reverse process, and the output of the, the original function is like the input of the new process. Okay. Right? That was just what happened with the f and c functions, right? Yeah. What, you know? Can you do that b real quick one more time? This one? Yeah. No, the, uh, the next b. This. Yeah, so really, we've got that q inverse... So Q of something, one, not times, not times. Uh, equals P of X. No. Forget about the P of X. We've got to figure out what 
what input into Q inverse would give us 0. That's the same as the output of Q of 0. Right? So would you look for a particular P of X value that gives you 0? No, we're not there yet. We have nothing to do with P of X yet. We're trying to figure out what, what output of Q gives 0. Because that would be the input of Q inverse that would give 0. Nope. Zero. Nope. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Negative one. Negative one. Right? Yeah. Okay. So, so now we're saying that that thing that we just found, negative one, that's equal to P. So P of X um, equals negative one. So we're asking what input into P outputs negative 1. Uh, it's so simple, but it's just easy. It's troubling. Here, try this. The unlearning things are so difficult. Mm -hmm. There, try four. Are you still recording this right now? Yeah. Is it okay? Yeah. yeah. I wanna, no, I want to go back and watch this again. But actually, yeah. Okay, so P is negative 1. So there's no, there is no input. So we're trying to figure out what this equals, right? Well, you, you would start with the Q inverse of negative 1, correct? Uh huh. Okay, so if you end up at negative 1, you would have to start with 0, right? So, Q inverse of negative 1. What is Q inverse of negative 1? Is negative 1 the input or output of Q? She wants output. What do you think? Yeah. That's the, if that's the input of Q inverse, it's the output of Q. Right. So, Q. So, this whole thing that I've. One. Right. Which is what? So what is what I've underlined here? What is that equal to? One. That's zero. You see why? Because if this is the input into Q inverse, it must be the output of Q. Where is the output of Q negative one? Zero. So now we have P inverse of zero. Is that the input or the output of? P, a regular P is a, the output. Right. Regular P, it's the output. So therefore, this is input of P that would output 0, which is? 2. Two. <coughs> Real but. quick, so this would be P what? P of 3 equals what? So P of 3, so the negative 1. This is negative 1. But P of 3 equals negative 1. No, it doesn't. I see, what, I see what you're thinking, but like... Remember, which is, for the P function, which is output and which is input? Which is output and which is input? The output? Yeah. Input. Input. So how do you evaluate oh, P, P of so 3? P of 3 means 3 is the input. input. Output. input. So the output would be 4. Okay, 4. Okay. four. Thank you for saying this thing. Oh, sure. My pleasure. <laughs>